Hey, Brent, my name's Steve. And you know what? We need to talk about some things, okay? The first thing I want to let you know is that you, nobody here is going to beat you up. Nobody here is going to hurt you. Nobody here is going to do anything like that to you, okay? You're safe. All we're interested in doing is finding out the truth. In the spring of 1996, in a juvenile interrogation room, police sat down to question a six-year-old. They would later charge the boy with the attempted murder of a one-month-old baby. The six-year-old kicked, punched, and beat the baby with a broomstick. An attempted killer. There's literally no hope for the baby right now. Clinging to life. Everyone involved is stunned. It was a case that shattered the very idea of childhood. How could someone so young be so violent? Some neighbors had described the boy as mean and a troublemaker. Very, very bad. He was the victim of a broken home, allowed to run the streets. And he's not an evil child. And police say showed no remorse for the beating. He was mean, he sometimes. Can you show me how you kicked the baby? Show me. The crime set off a national debate. Should the six-year-old be treated as a disturbed child or punished like a criminal? Good morning, I'm Ron Owens, this is KGO. He should be put away permanently if necessary because he is a danger. I don't think the kid knew exactly what he was doing. And you got to do something with this child. And, and this is not an anomaly. This is in some ways a very classic case. We've seen a, a big downshift in the age at which people are committing murder. And over the past year, I think the statistics would show that there's something like 100 children under the age of 10 who have been charged in some way with murder. Can you show me how you hit her? Like that, three times? Okay, so you hit her like that three times after you kicked her two times. Then what else? Funding for Frontline is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. This is Frontline. It all happened in Richmond, California, near San Francisco, in a poor neighborhood of blacks and Latinos called the Iron Triangle. It began with a six-year-old boy who wanted a big wheel, the favorite tricycle in his neighborhood. Late on a hot day, the boy's grandmother let him out to play while he waited for his mother to come home from work. The six-year-old was soon joined by eight-year-old twin brothers who were being watched by their older sister, Roxanne. The day that this incident happened, it was my birthday, so I came home from work, which was around 5.30 or something like that, and um, they was in the house, and it was hot outside, and um, I told them they can go outside. They was good, normal kids. I mean, I ain't saying they was perfect kids, but they was normal kids. Over here, Ricky. Down the street, the three boys were spotted by a neighbor, Ophelia Stringer. I was sitting on my porch. It was an average day, you know, everybody sitting outside, kids playing. Get the ball back. You know, we were just sitting there. We saw them playing out all day. Later, outside this apartment building, another neighbor saw one of the boys hiding a big wheel tricycle in a bush. Suspicious, he rushed inside where he discovered a baby bloody and unconscious. He ran outside and started screaming at the three boys. You know, they ran down here and they were like, um, I didn't, you know, it wasn't me, it wasn't me, laugh. Cause you know, they, of course you react to a man coming outside yelling at you and, and the adults are gonna ask questions like, what did you do to make a man react like that? And they were just like, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. And laughing, laughing and joking. And they ran up and down the street. And then when they saw the police, they got scared and they ran in the backyard of the twins' house. 
Ignacio Bermudez and his wife had left the baby with their older daughter while they went shopping. I saw a lot of police by the house, and people were gathered around the house, right? And then, then I got closer and I asked the children, what happened? Your boy, they said. They hit him. But all my children are here. It's not my child. All my children are here. I never, I never imagined it was my youngest child. Bermudez rushed to the hospital, where his month-old baby boy was in critical condition with severe head injuries. A little while later, my wife arrived. She was crying by then, and she tells me, Nacho, she says, they're saying that the boy was hit. They say he was hit really bad with a stick, they say. No, that can't be. That someone would hit a child? A child doesn't do anything, right? I got near him and I told him, you're going to get better, you're not going to die. I want you to come home with me. He just blinked his little eyes. I touched his face and his feet, and he shrunk away. As the baby clung to life, the people of the Iron Triangle gathered to pray for his survival and to wonder how this could have happened. The Richmond police knew exactly who they were looking for. The next day, they picked up the three boys. How you guys doing? Captain Ray Howard headed the investigation. We weren't prepared. Nothing had prepared us for anything like this because it never had occurred. We had no idea uh, exactly how we were going to handle this thing. Uh, we knew what we had, but how do you handle it when it involves a, a suspect? or suspects this young. The police videotaped their interrogation of the boys. This is the first time those tapes have been seen. Detective Daryl Jackson started with the eight-year-old twins. They were giving different stories or minimizing their involvement in the incident itself. One child uh, initially told us that he never went inside. Another stated that they just took the bike and he left. And then one of them put everything off on the other. So you walked into the bedroom? Yeah. Okay, so you did go in the bedroom. You talk to one kid, you may or may not believe everything he is telling you, but you take it and you set them down off and then you're back with the rest of them and you bring someone else in. Listen to what that person has to say. And you say, well, so-and-so just told me this. Your brother told us earlier today that you were actually standing in the room with him when all this was happening. I wasn't in the room. Your brother said you were. You can't forget what you're involved in. You're still on a fact-finding mission. And as police officers, you, you mean you have hearts. Um, some things you see, you want to break down and cry, but you can't because you have a job to do. And if you don't do your job, it doesn't get done. I'm not going to talk to you. I'm not going to talk to you again. Huh? I'm not going to talk to you again. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you one chance to tell the truth. And when you walk out that door, that's going to be your last chance. The twins finally confessed that they were in the apartment, but said it was the six-year-old who had beaten the baby. Look at me. Are you telling me the truth or a lie? The truth. I don't believe you. I want you to tell me the truth, okay? He looked like a six-year-old. He didn't look like and didn't act like a child who could commit this kind of an act. Um, he looked like a kid who I might have taught in a Sunday school class, you know. How many times did you kick the baby? Kick the baby around the head four times? Three times. Did you punch the baby too? How many times did you punch the baby? Uh, seven times. He tried to state that he just thought it was a doll. 
She didn't believe that it was actually a baby. Whether I believe that or not, I don't know. Can you show me how you kicked the baby? Show me. Just two times? Mm -hmm. Show me again. Show me how you did it. I'm still not convinced that these kids knew the gravity of what they were doing. To this day, I, I, I still don't believe they knew how bad the situation was in terms of what they did to that infant and what they did to themselves. This uh, six-year-old boy invaded basically another person's house and mercilessly beat an infant. And we have a responsibility in the interest of public safety to try to do something about that. And that's what we're trying to do here. Do you continue to prosecute this case? Yes. We have the prosecutor, prosecutor, Harold Jewett, decided to charge the six-year-old with attempted murder. No. It doesn't matter whether you're six or you're 106. If you do something that hurts somebody else with knowledge of the wrongfulness of it, you're responsible for it, period. You know uh, bring your brother inside. You know did, he, did he do it? I knew a different kid than I, I heard about in the news where he was portrayed as being a sort of a menace to society or a danger because of his, you know, they were worried about his uh, impact on society, which I just found incredible. Um, that wasn't the kid that I knew. Are you a monitor? Marco Gonzalez is principal of Lincoln Elementary School, where the six-year-old attended kindergarten. Yes, sir. Oh, oh, wait, wait, don't, don't, oh. Excuse me, excuse me. What is going on between the two of you? He got my brother like this and squashed his neck and threw him down. I've seen other kids who kind of show a more, sort of a little more mean streak in them, a little more uh, apt to react strongly to somebody else. You know, if somebody pushes me, I'm going to turn and hit him. In fact, I didn't see him hit you, but I saw you hit him. You hit him right in the jaw just now. But that wasn't his nature as I knew it. He wouldn't necessarily turn around and say, was that an accident? But he wouldn't turn around and slug you just because you might have run into him. I guess I thought of him as a normal kid. Hyperactive, a little bit, uh, a little bit over energetic. He liked to draw attention to himself, kind of uh, goofing around, being a little bit of a, of a class clown. Come on, you guys, quit playing around. Uh, but the boy did have some problems at school. Tests showed that he was mildly retarded and had to repeat kindergarten. Room seven, you're the point person, the monitor. I don't believe a six-year-old understands the concept of life and death, like we as adults know it. So I don't think that a six-year-old in this particular one um, understood that what he did could lead to the death of a child. Did he believe he was able to, maybe able to shut the kid up because the kids start crying, because the baby bassinet was apparently knocked over, and now they were being, some of, there was a tip-off that they were in, in, the, in the house that they didn't belong in, looking for a, a tricycle or a Hot Wheels. Yeah, you know, I could believe that. But that he, that he went in there with an intention to kill a baby? No way. I just, it's, I just don't think it's possible. I don't believe that that's what happened. In the Iron Triangle, most of the neighbors agreed with Gonzalez. He was a nice kid, happy. You know, always looking for something to do, always looking for somebody to play with. You know, average. You know? But there were signs of trouble. All the kids used to play during the day and stuff. And sometimes when it came to evening time, when all the kids, you know, the doors were closing up and down the block, kids were being called in for dinner, he would kind of be kind of left out. But he would just walk on along probably to the next house or the next block, because I'm quite sure he had more friends than just on this block. But later in the evening, when the kids did go in, he would be just continue his journey. One evening, just days before the beating, the six-year-old showed up at the Bermuda's apartment. One day he came to the house. It would have been around 8 or 8.30 at night with a stick in his hand like this. There were, were all of us talking in the living room. He knocked on the door, so I opened the door and he got in like this and went running with the stick in his hand saying, the police, and I'm going to kill him. It was a boy playing, of course, right? And I told him, boy, go home. 
this is a child who is presently in kindergarten and this is on his second time in kindergarten and he has had uh, testing that suggested he is a kid that is in need of, of a lot of help. Uh, John Burris, a noted civil rights attorney, offered to represent the six-year-old pro bono. What it was it like to have a six-year-old child uh, as a client uh, was the most challenging experience I have ever had because <clears throat> the hallmark of representation is the ability to communicate with the client, the ability to get some understanding of uh, what the case is, the ability to talk to you about it. And, and the challenge we had here is that we had a six-year-old that we couldn't talk to. I never got an account of what happened. Not that I didn't try. I tried. Every session, in some way, was designed to get back to the event. I was on the floor with him. He was in my lap. And I read to him, played toys with him. I did all those things, uh, but not successfully. What's the truth? I want to know the truth. The boy's mother was present during some of the questioning. Yeah. Look. Look, stop lying right now. Do you understand that? Stop lying right now. What happened? Lisa was 26, a single mother, and a part-time child care worker. Look at me and tell me the truth right now. Did you hear the baby crying? Court records would report that the boy had been neglected and characterized the mother as a well-intentioned but inadequate parent. Why did you knock the baby crib over? You did it on purpose, didn't you? My instincts were that this was a decent lady that who was trying to do the best she could with what she had and that she wasn't a woman who maybe was abusive or a drug addict etc cetera, etc cetera. that what happened happened but it wasn't a function of this boy not having a mother are you okay are you okay the six-year-old never knew his father a drug dealer from another part of Richmond. When the boy was four, his father was murdered on the street, shot six times in the head. And the issue was how much of that information did the kid know? And the kid did know that his father had died violently, but the kid also fantasized about it. He thought that he was present and that he had seen it. One truth of the matter is he had not seen anything about the kid's, uh, the father's death. And that was symbolic of this child's um, state of mind. He played violence. You know, the, 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 the Transformers and the Mutant Ninja Turtles and hitting with sticks. I used to watch him. He could do this for hours and hours and hours. And I think this was, whatever you want to call that, rage. You know, love sticks, love hitting. Not people, not animals, things. He'd pound on this brick until it was you know, pulp. Archie Anderson is the boy's great uncle. He had to get totally exhausted. But like he was angry though. Oh, man. very angry. Got every reason well to be. If he ain't angry, then he ain't paying attention. You know, yeah, he's very angry. He, uh, my, my grandnephew should have been seeing a shrink the day he was born. The boy lived here in this house with his mother and grandmother a house where crack was plentiful. You know, you had some situations where my nephew, they'd be over there getting ready to get high, and he'd be in the house, and they'd say, go outside and play. Man, it's 9 o'clock at night. Play with what? 9 p.m. It's a school night. This kid standing outside on the sidewalk, don't know what to do. The six-year-old always called Anderson Uncle Skeets. He says the boy's grandmother, his own sister Phyllis, was a crack dealer with a violent temper. His grandmother, Phyllis, was off the hook, as they say out here. Yell and scream over anything. Ah, violent. No shit. You motherfuckers, well, get out there. You know, no cut right to the bone arguing with you. You know, no holds back. You know how you don't want to say, you just, you know, none of that. She just sliced you right, right up. Uncle Skeets says the boy's mother, Lisa, didn't use drugs, but she brought a series of violent boyfriends into the house. Brandon role modeled himself after Lisa's boyfriends, who all split her lip, put her in battered women's homes, you know, choked her, you know, threw glass at Brandon, you know, yelled at him, you know, uh, tied him up, 
And all this, Lisa didn't either believe was happening or wasn't aware of what was happening until after the man would be out of the scene. I can't, uh, I can't tell you how many men that Sam, her brother, touch him again, I'm going to kill you. Skeet says that given all the drugs and all the violence, it was inevitable that his nephew would get in some kind of trouble. The number one rule of the game in Richmond is, ain't no rule. It's the number one rule. There are no rules. I don't have to do anything for you. Don't have to, you don't have to trust me. I can lie, cheat, and steal, and that's okay. And that's how it works out here. And that's what my nephew, that's what my nephew got exposed to from a diaper. We're learning more and more about what produces violence in children. Typically, there would be the child himself would have witnessed violence. The, the mother might have uh, been beaten herself, and the child would have seen this, or that and somebody would have beaten the child, whether it's the mother or the, the father or a live-in boyfriend who would have beaten the child. And this sets an example for the child. Uh, the child models their own behavior on this. See you later. Bye. Fox Butterfield is a national correspondent for the New York Times. He specializes in the criminal justice system. Another thing uh, which produces violence in, in kids, which is somewhat surprising to us, is if a, a child has a father who's in prison. This too can be a kind of powerful, if perverse, example. And the child starts to fantasize about the father, even the absent father, and wants to emulate him. And we, we know that that now uh, can, can influence the child. In, in fact, about half of all kids who are locked up in juvenile reformatories around the country today have fathers or other close relatives who have been previously incarcerated. Criminologists like to talk about risk factors. The more risk factors that you have, the greater the probability of something going wrong in your own life. And this boy seems to have had virtually all of them. People from the Bay Area were shocked by the six-year-old's brutal assault on the baby. But it was not the first time they were confronted with the horror of childhood violence. Twenty-five years earlier in San Francisco, in a basement in the Fillmore District, police had discovered the battered body of a 20-month-old baby boy. The body was found on a crucifix. The feet and the hands and the neck were tied. Uh, the boards were not joined at the intersection, but it has the appearance of a crucifixion type of a homicide. When the body was found, the baby had already been missing for five days. Police discovered that the baby was last seen with two young boys. The boys were brothers, seven and ten, and they soon confessed to what came to be known as the crucifixion murder. There was some uh, play going on, according to them, the, the infant was struck accidentally with a brick. We believe that the boys panicked, struck him again repeatedly, and uh, to stop his crying, uh, cupped their hands over his mouth until uh, what they described, he, just, he uh, stopped breathing. They then took him over to another end of the uh, sub-basement, uh, removed his clothing, and uh, tied and wired him to a wooden cross, and then uh, put a rope around his neck and uh, tightened it. It gets hard when I have to, you know, talk about it, or, or that the thoughts or images come to me. It's, it gets really hard to put those away. But they're still there. I mean, I'll, they'll, they'll be there for the rest of my life. This man we call Bobby was a 10-year-old killer in the crucifixion murder. To protect his privacy, we have altered his appearance. Bobby still remembers the day 25 years ago when he and his younger brother Billy were playing in the park. I saw this kid playing by himself and went over and, and played with him for a little while. And, 
And then we uh, asked him where his mom was and didn't quite get an answer. So we took him by the hand and started walking around. And we asked a few people and nobody knew. About a block and a half away, we had a little spot that uh, me and Billy had been to a couple of times. It was a, underneath a building. It was kind of like a fort area, I guess. The baby started crying, and and we tried all the ways that I could think of to try to get it to stop crying. And I think eventually I just started to get mad that it wouldn't stop crying. I tried to use physical violence to make it be quiet. I think I slapped it, and it got worse. It started getting more physical and more violent. And where was Billy while this was happening, and how was he reacting to this? I think he didn't know what to think, really, at first. And I think seeing his big brother doing this probably felt like this was the thing to do and, and joined in. At that point, when I saw a bruised baby, and it wasn't moving, and the only thing that I can think of was, you know, I really didn't mean to do this. I didn't want this to happen. And I don't remember being very religious, but I, I felt like this was the only thing to do. And it was along the lines of resurrecting. You know, I wanted, I wanted it to be undone. I wanted that the baby back alive. I wasn't absolutely sure it was dead, but it, it wasn't moving and it wasn't bruised. So I put it in a cross formation and well, I hoped. I hoped the baby would come alive. Yeah. Despite the horror of the crime, the baby's mother said she forgave the young killers and hoped they would receive the therapy they needed. 25 years ago, the public's mood was equally forgiving, but a lot has changed. Society has definitely become more punitive over the past 25 years, with kids in particular. Uh, we are trying more children as adults in adult criminal courts. Uh, we are giving them longer sentences. We are faced with more and more very violent uh, children, and we're uh, uncertain how to deal with them. We have not found very good answers, and it's profoundly scary. We Nineteen ninety-six, the prosecutor's decision to charge the six-year-old with attempted murder set off a public protest. The attempted murder charge also ignited a debate among legal and mental health professionals about what to do with the six-year-old. From the prosecutor's point of view, he wanted what we consider to be a finding, a determination in the, in the criminal side of the juvenile justice system that this boy had committed a crime. That's what he wanted. And he wanted to be able to do that and, and, and to use it in a political way to show that he was tough on crime, and regardless of the age of the person, they were going to be punished in his court. I felt it was important that the other kids in his neighborhood or wherever he is living be protected from him. He has a complete uh, lack of remorse, at least he did during this time, and a, a history that suggests that uh, there's no impediment to his reoffending and it was clear that something had to be done before somebody else got hurt. We had a kid in trouble. That meant to me that you don't punish the kid in trouble like he's a criminal. What you then do is how can we address ourselves to that need? We're here because we need to find out the truth. We don't want to hear any more lies. We hear lies every day. As the case proceeded, the performance of the police also came under scrutiny. When the videotapes were brought to my office and I had an opportunity uh, to review them, uh, and review them in the context of legal significance, I, I was really shocked. Uh, shocked in the sense that this young boy was being inter interrogated by 
seasoned police officers as if he was a 20 year old. There was no real effort made by the police agency to give due recognition that they were really talking about a six year old. Are you going to want to tell me the truth? Good. Before I do, I need to tell you some things though, okay? He was not being overbearing in any way. Uh, it was not my impression at all that he was trying to intimidate or uh, otherwise coerce in some sense of the word uh, any information from the kids and I thought they did a they did a great job do you know what a lawyer is that's somebody who will will help you and represent you in court and things like that and your mom knows what a lawyer is and since she's here I'll tell her too that you have the right to have a lawyer with you before and during any questioning we all recognize that one of the most sacred principles that we have here is called the Miranda warnings, that a person cannot be compelled to give testimony or even talk uh, without a clear understanding uh, of his legal rights. Well, Miranda requires that it's a voluntary waiver and a clear understanding of what those rights are. There is no way in a uh, snow snowball in he hell that this six-year-old ever understood what his legal rights were. And at any point, anything, he would only nod when, when, the, when the weight and the presence of the law was on him. Do you want to tell me the truth? Can you say yes or no? With your mouth instead of your head? It's the central question in the case would become whether the boy was competent to stand trial. The juvenile court judge decided to appoint three mental health experts to answer that question. One of them was Dr. Martin Blender, a forensic psychiatrist who reviewed the police videotapes and spent an hour with the boy at juvenile hall. I must say, in truth, I was surprised after I completed my assessment to find the six-year-old competent. My bias going in was, this is ridiculous. How can a six-year-old be competent to stand trial? How could he have even understood what he was doing, no less uh, what a trial is all about? But the kids watch television, they watch the cop shows, and they, they watch the, the lawyer shows, or they have, they may not watch them like they watch Sesame Street, but, but the kids are tremendously aware these days. So this kid was, certainly was aware that he was in deep trouble and that there were certain procedures that were likely to befall him. The other experts, including Dr. Edward Hyman, a child psychologist, disagreed. There's a real question in my mind, uh, not in terms of soft, humane factors, but rather uh, just in terms of what developmental studies tell us about children, whether a six-year-old should even be involved at any level in juvenile justice system. Uh, to elucidate that, I, I turned to a gifted uh, six-year-old and asked him what might happen to him if he had done something very, very wrong. He said, you mean like killing somebody? I said, yes. And he turned to me and he said, I'd have to go to the principal's office for a really long time. Even when we turn to a very gifted child, a child in understanding this, understood that it was wrong, but really didn't have the specific understanding of the uh, magnitude of the transgression or, or how we, as a society, react to something that we call attempted murder. He understood that society considered what he had done wrong, which is why he was being locked up in juvenile hall. He knew the judge's task. He knew the jo the, his lawyer was there to help him. He knew the prosecutor was going to gather the evidence against him. And he understood that if things didn't go his way, he might not go home to see his mommy for a long, long time. So despite his juvenility, I felt that he grasped the essentials of what a trial proceeding was, why he was going to be tried, and what the penalties might be. He attributed a level of communications with the boy, and even about me, that was preposterous. It was a flat lie. Because, and to be kind, what he did was suggested all the answers. And, and, the, and, the, and the kid undoubtedly had to nod, and then he put it in the news, in the report, seemingly. And, and I could say this because I said it in court. The kid did not have a conversation about who I am and that I was going to take care of him, that I was looking out for his rights, all the things that I said in court, because it didn't happen. To that day, as I told the court, the kid referred to me as Mrs. Burris. He didn't have a clue 
that men are Mr. and women are Mrs. And he had no clue that Mrs. Burris, as he referred to me, was a lawyer. So how could he say he was looking out for him? And so for this person to come back with a report that suggested that he was competent really offended any notions of professionality. Uh, and I said so. What's up, Paul? Huh? <laughs> While the experts argued about what should be done with the six-year-old, he remained locked up in a juvenile hall unit with 19 other offenders, most of them teenagers. Guard Walt Parker took a shine to the boy. Most of the time, the six-year-old, most of the time, he, he would call me Mr. Walt, or either he would, every once in a while, the kids called me Swamp Dog. He couldn't really say Swamp Dog. He would say, hey, dog, hey, dog. <laughs> In the exercise yard, the six-year-old liked to play catch with Swamp Dog. If you started throwing the football with him, you had to throw it mostly for 30 or 20 minutes without stopping because he wanted, he wanted to show you that he can catch every pass you throw to him. He enjoyed that. We were always surprised, frankly, how happy he was. But it was a very strange signal. I mean, most kids who are 15, 16, they go to juvenile hall, they're like whining and crying if they're the first time out of the box. But not him. Not him. My opposition to juvenile hall, though, was rooted in the fact that he was the youngest kid there by six or seven years. And that he was there with older kids and learning about things that older kids are talking about. He really got into the, the genre of teenage kids liking each other and girls and boys and uh, God knows what else he, he was learning uh, there. But there was one thing the six-year-old didn't like. At 10.30 each night, he would be locked up in his cell until the next morning. He hated it. He hated it. I couldn't see myself locking him up and knowing that he was going to cry. But once, like, after about two weeks, he got kind of used to it. And every once in a while, what we would do, we pull the door. We wouldn't lock it all the way. And he would open the door and look out and say, you didn't lock my door. He wants to play with you. And then we kind of lock it a little bit and tell him it's time to go to bed now. He was a likable little man. I kind of took him under and he was my son. <laughs> the boy remained locked up for two months while the experts argued over the proper diagnosis for his mental condition. He had a somewhat ominous track record even before he committed this. He was something of a bully uh, back at school, fascinated with guns. He drowned the family cat, set some fires, had some bedwetting problems. All characteristics of individuals who later on, at the age of 18, 19, 20, commit a series of crimes, finally get to the scrutiny of folks like me, and then are definitively diagnosed antisocial personality. Can you tell me why you punched the baby and why you kicked the baby? Uh, he injured the child simply because, quote, I decided to. It's the Himalayas, it's Mount McKinley. I did it because it was there. Can you show me how you put the baby on the floor? I felt that he was a psychopath in the making. I certainly have never used that term before, but this young man was so evidently suffused with all of the findings that when they fully blossom later in life would call for this diagnosis that I was comfortable in talking about him having a nascent sociopathic personality or a psychopath in the making. I was able to make the diagnosis here because I had seen so many sociopaths over the years. I can almost smell them. Did you decide to because you want, because somebody had hurt you? One element that emerged in this case was the suggestion that uh, a uh, six-year-old could be diagnosed as a psychopath. Wrong, right? And uh, from the perspective of science, uh, this is one of the most ludicrous assertions uh, that we can contend with. Not only is this a determination for a child um, absolutely uh, forbidden by all the research, contraindicated by all the research uh, in uh, development, um, but forensically, uh, to think that this could be generated by an hour long uh, or even a two hour long uh, uh, interview um, 
is, is the height of abuse. What do you do with a six-year-old like this? One thing that works is you sequester them so that they no longer have a society to attack. There are obviously a variety of, of ethical and moral and psychological reasons why this may not be a good or a permanent solution. But it's very tempting uh, to, to make sure that they don't have the opportunity to do the kind of damage that we know they will be capable of. There's no doubt in my mind but that we can effectively uh, influence the life of any six-year-old, the most violent six-year-old included. And to desist from this, to reject that challenge, to turn away from that child, uh, is, I believe, uh, very, very abusive. Can very young and very violent children be helped? Can they change? Like the six-year-old in Richmond, Bobby and Billy grew up in a tough neighborhood. They too were physically abused and neglected. After the crucifixion murder, the brothers received two years of therapy and were then returned to the custody of their mother. Bobby is now 36 years old. People change. People with the right direction can change in the right direction over time. I'm a productive citizen. I'm doing well as a father. I'm doing well as a worker. I make a living for myself and my family. I stayed out of trouble with the law. I know that I've, I've got control of myself enough and I know myself well enough to, to know that I would never uh, harm anybody like that again. A thorough search of the record confirmed that Bobby has been a law-abiding citizen since the murder, but his younger brother Billy was a different story. Billy had appeared in juvenile court repeatedly on a variety of charges. As an adult, Billy committed four felonies. Two of them were for the physical abuse of children, including his own three-month-old son. Billy spent two years in prison where he sought treatment for drug and alcohol problems. He's a good person. I mean, the core of him is a good person. Um, he's just headed down some wrong roads here and there. Um, I can't really say what's really different about our lives as far as as far as how he handled the past I know it probably had a, a deeper effect is it most well, definitely had a different effect on him he was younger but our environments were similar enough uh, what's, that's the hard question I really don't know how to, to say why I think Bobby and Billy represent where we are, which is that, I mean, there's some can be changed and some children obviously can be saved and that's the wonderful hope. And some it's very difficult to save. And we still don't know precisely why. Can you show me how you kick the baby? Show me. Generally, as a, as a rule of thumb, the earlier the kid starts and the more uh, violent the, the, the offenses that the kid commits at that early age, the more difficult it's going to be to change them, the, and the more offenses they're likely to commit later. He was not ever going to get the kind of help he was going to get, and probably the probably one of the things that maybe there is a God in the spirit world, because if and God forgive me, I'm very sorry what happened to that 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 kid, that baby. I mean, it it, it for the life of me, I give my right arm for all this not to have happened. But you know something? The positive is, it got that kid out of this community and it might have saved a whole family's life one day when he was 16 and decided to climb through somebody's window. Us two, three, us two. Uncle Skeet says he wasn't surprised by his nephew's brutal attack on the baby. He says it was not a question of if, but when the boy would turn violent. Every adult male member of my family has a police record for assault and then when he caught his beef at six years old, I said, oh my God, this covers every adult, every male in my family from 80 to six. Every one of us have at one point in our lives 
assaulted somebody. We have done GBA, GBI, GBH to somebody. Great bodily injury, GBI. Every, Every one male member of Every male your member in my family has from the age of 80 to down, down to, to 6 has shot age. or stabbed or assaulted somebody, including me. The problem for me stems from my conviction that this sort of character disorder, and certainly a character disorder of this early severity, is probably largely genetic. What's this? There is something to be said for the phrase, natural born killer. It's my view that most of what I found was predestined by his genetic endowment. He was born that way. I believe he was born that way, yes. I don't believe there's any scientific evidence that there, that there is a genetic basis for violence, that there is such a thing as a natural born killer. Uh, perhaps someday science will get there, but we're certainly not there yet. Um, however, there is some evidence that biology, as opposed to genetics, uh, may play a role. You showed me earlier that you punched her face. Is that where you punched her all three times? Right there. For example, a boy like this boy uh, watching his mother be beaten or himself being beaten, uh, that, that that kind of environmental stress can actually produce a biological change in the boy, can have some effect on, the, on a child's brain. So it's not nature versus nurture. It's not one or the other. It's a combination of the two. The boy's mother and family friends came to court for this crucial ruling on whether the six-year-old is competent to stand trial for assault. After two months of psychiatric debate and legal maneuvering, the judge finally ruled in the case of the six-year-old. He said the boy was not competent to stand trial and suspended the criminal charges indefinitely. But he also ruled that the boy should be removed from the custody of his mother on the grounds that she had provided inadequate supervision. The boy was transferred to a group home for disturbed children to receive intensive therapy. You know, I'm glad that he's getting help that he needed and he's not like a, you know, locked up like a criminal, which he isn't, you know, and, you know, get the help that he needs so um, he'll be able to come home soon, you know, when he, when he gets better. But the prosecutor said he would still press charges if the boy were later judged competent. We are not looking to just, you know, separate this child from his mother out of some base desire to hurt him or something. We want to help him. But I'm persuaded, based upon everything that I've read, that it's counterproductive to return him back to home when he so desperately needs a, a professional uh, assessment and influence in his life that apparently he didn't get or didn't want uh, while he was still living at home. And I don't think you can do that overnight. I think it's a long, slow, brick by brick process that will take years. And if years go by and we see progress, then it may be at that point we'll say, okay, there's no further good that can come out of continuing this criminal prosecution. And justice dictates that we let it go. But it's going to take years before we reach that point, in my mind. It doesn't end the case, but it does give me what I want to get done, and that is that he gets treatment, he gets help, and sort of a, uh, a, a, a away from the glare of the publicity, away from everyone asking questions about it, and for the treatment to go forward, and that's what's happening now. Bundled in a blanket, fast asleep in his mother's arms, two-month-old Ignacio Bermudez Jr. left Children's Hospital in Oakland today. Doctors say the baby's condition is stable enough to allow Ignacio's parents to take care of him. The areas that have been damaged are permanently damaged, and he has had a, se a severe brain injury, and multiple areas of his brain on both sides of the brain have been injured. A year later, the baby's condition hasn't improved. He still can't sit up and suffers from seizures. The doctors fear he may never learn to walk or talk. Maybe he's going to be like that all his life, you know. It's going to be sad for him like it will be for us. 
and sometimes it makes me want to cry. And I cry, see, but there's nothing you can do. It's total sadness. Despite the tragedy, Mr. Bermuda says he forgives the six-year-old boy who beat his son. He doesn't want the boy prosecuted and hopes he receives the therapy he needs. My wife and I were already suffering more than enough with our son. I don't want to see anyone suffer for their son. Even the son who hit my child, I don't want him or his mother suffering because I think that what we were already suffering was enough. The prognosis for the six-year-old is also guarded. After nine months of intensive treatment, therapists report he is only now beginning to talk about the physical abuse he suffered. And so far, they say, he hasn't responded well to therapy. Given the severity of his disorder, I tend to be pessimistic that we're going to make enough of a change uh, to substantially improve his, his chances of, of leading a productive life. I think the kid can be saved. I'm confident that we can put him on the right track so that he can be a, a good citizen as he grows up. But we know it's a long process. You know, the kid has suffered a lot. Uh, suffered in ways that probably are unimaginable uh, for us to think. And, and, and so we, we have to undo that. I continue to hold hope for Brandon T., just like I was holding hope for Ignacio Bermudez, that he will come around. And I don't want to condemn him by saying no matter what we do, he will kill again. Uh, time will tell, I guess. Check out Frontline's website and join the discussion on kids, violence, and crime. Find resources there for parents and families. There's a Q&A forum with national experts about what puts a child at risk. And can a violent child be saved? Read the interview with the psychiatrist of the six-year-old, profile of a treatment center handling troubled children. Explore Frontline Online at www.pbs.org. The mailbag was full after our program, The Fixers, a report on influence peddling and shady fundraising by an Asian-American couple on behalf of the Democratic Party. Here's a sample. Dear Frontline, as a lifelong Democrat, I am ashamed of my party for resorting to the tactics described in your broadcast. Unfortunately, there is no mention of similar tactics used by the Republicans in the same election. Frank Heber... Another Democrat was offended enough to complain to the president, and he sent us a copy of that letter. Dear Mr. President, here's an excerpt. Corruption, influence buying, cover-ups, everything I want you and the Democratic Party to be against seems closer to you and your associates than I ever thought possible. I'm a Democrat, and I want you to know that this thing smells. Respectfully, Robert... But M. there were a few comments, like this one. Dear Frontline, whatever the Lums did, or any other donator for that matter, does not change the fact that this country is fortunate that Mr. Clinton is again our president. Please give him the credit he deserves for all the hard work he has done to pull this country out of the pit we fell into before his presidency. Jana Shree... And then there were some viewers who felt the program unfairly targeted Asian Americans. Dear Frontline, this one-sided racist scapegoating must stop. The trash you broadcast tonight to disguise as, quote, journalism, unquote, was just another in the endless stories which single out Asian Americans for scrutiny not enjoyed by the major campaign contributors who truly do influence policy in this country. Let us know what you thought about tonight night's program.
Funding for Frontline is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. Frontline is produced for the Documentary Consortium by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. For video cassette information about this program, please call this toll free number 1 800 328 PBS 1. This is PBS.